You you worked um, at Google for about a decade, right? Yeah. What brought you there? I have a son who has learning difficulties. And in order to be sure he would never be out on the street, I needed to get several million dollars. And I wasn't going to get that as an academic. I tried. So I taught a Coursera course in the hope that I'd make lots of money that way, but there was no money in that. Mm -hmm. So I figured out, well, the only way to get millions of dollars is to sell myself to a big company. And so when I was 65, fortunately for me, I had two brilliant students who produced something called AlexNet, which was a neural net that was very good at recognizing objects and images. And so Ilya and Alex and I set up a little company and auctioned it. And we actually set up an auction where we had a number of big companies bidding for us. And that company was called AlexNet? No, the, the, the network that recognized objects was called AlexNet. The company was called DNN Research, Deep Neural Network Research. And it was doing things like this. I'll put this uh, yeah, graph up on the that's screen. Yeah, that's AlexNet. This picture shows eight images and AlexNet's ability, which is your company's ability, to spot what was in those images. Yeah. So it could tell the difference between various kinds of mushroom. And about 12% of ImageNet is dogs. <laughs> and to be good at ImageNet, you have to tell the difference between very similar kinds of dog. And it would got to be very good at that. And um, your, your company, AlexNet, won several awards, I believe, for its ability to outperf outperform its competitors. And so Google ultimately ended up acquiring your technology. Google acquired that technology and some other technology. And you went to work at Google at age, what, 66? I went at age 65 to work at Google. 65. And you left at age 76? 75. 75, okay. I worked there for more or less exactly 10 years. And what were you doing there? Okay, they were very nice to me. They said, they said pretty much, you can do what you like. I worked on something called distillation that did really work well. And that's now used all the time. In AI. In AI. And distillation is a way of taking what a big model knows, a big neural net knows, and getting that knowledge into a small neural net. Then at the end, I got very interested in analog computation and whether it would be possible to get these big language models running in analog hardware so they used much less energy. Mm -hmm. And it was when I was doing that work that I began to really realize how much better digital is for sharing information. Was there a eureka moment? There was a eureka month or two. Um, and it was a sort of coupling of ChatGPT coming out, although Google had very similar things a year earlier. And I'd seen those, and that had a big effect on me. The closest I had to a eureka moment was when a Google system called Palm was able to say why a joke was funny. And I'd always thought of that as a kind of landmark. If it can say why a joke's funny, it really does understand. Mm -hmm. And it could say why a joke was funny. <laughs> and that coupled with realizing why digital is so much better than analog for sharing information suddenly made me very interested in AI safety and that these things were going to get a lot smarter than us. Why did you leave Google? The main reason I left Google was because I was 75 mm -hmm. and I wanted to retire. I've done a very bad job of that. The precise timing of when I went, left Google was so that I could talk freely at a conference at MIT. But I left because I was, I'm old and I was finding it harder to program. I was making many more mistakes when I programmed, which is very annoying. You wanted to talk freely at a conference at MIT? Yes, at MIT, organized by MIT Tech Review. What did yeah. you want to talk about freely? AI safety. And you couldn't do that while you were at Google? Well, I could have done it while I was at Google. And Google encouraged me to stay and work on AI safety and said I could do whatever I liked on AI safety. You kind of censor yourself. If you work for a big company, you don't feel right saying things that will damage the big company. Even if you could get away with it, it just feels wrong to me. Mm. I didn't leave because I was cross with anything Google was doing. I think Google actually behaved very responsibly. When they had these big chatbots, they didn't release them, possibly because they were worried about their reputation. They had a very good reputation, and they didn't want to damage it. So OpenAI didn't have a reputation, and so they could afford to take the gamble. I mean, there's also a big conversation happening around how it will cannibalize their core business in search. 
There is now, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the old innovator's dilemma to some degree, I guess, exactly. that they're, they're yes, contending with. Bad skin. I've had it. And I'm sure many of you listening have had it too. Or maybe you have it right now. I know how draining it can be, especially if you're in a job where you're presenting often like I am. So let me tell you about something that's helped both my partner and me and my sister, which is red light therapy. I only got into this a couple of years ago, but I wish I'd known a little bit sooner. I've been using our show sponsors, Bond Charges Infrared Sauna Blanket for a while now, but I just got hold of their red light therapy mask as well. Red light has been proven to have so many benefits for the body. Like any area of your skin that's exposed will see a reduction in scarring, wrinkles, and even blemishes. It also helps with complexion. It boosts collagen, and it does that by targeting the upper layers of your skin. And Bond Charge ships worldwide with easy returns and a year-long warranty on all of their products. So if you'd like to try it yourself, head over to bondcharge.com diary and use code diary for 25% off any product site-wide. Just make sure you order through this link bondcharge.com slash diary with code diary. Make sure you keep what I'm about to say to yourself. I'm inviting 10,000 of you to come even deeper into the diary of a CEO. Welcome to my inner circle. This is a brand new private community that I'm launching to the world. We have so many incredible things that happen that you are never shown. We have the briefs that are on my iPad when I'm recording the conversation. We have clips we've never released. We have behind the scenes conversations with the guests and also the episodes that we've never ever released and so much more. In the circle, you'll have direct access to me. You can tell us what you want this show to be, who you want us to interview and the types of conversations you would love us to have. But remember, for now, we're only inviting the first 10,000 people that join before it closes. So if you want to join our private closed community, head to the link in the description below or go to doaccircle.com. I will speak to you there. I'm continually shocked by the types of individuals that listen to this conversation um, because they come up to me sometimes. So I hear from politicians, I hear from some rural people, I hear from entrepreneurs all over the world, whether they are the entrepreneurs building some of the biggest companies in the world or their you know, early stage startups. For those people that are listening to this conversation now, that are in positions of power and influence, world leaders, let's say, what's your message to them? I'd say what you need is highly regulated capitalism. That's what seems to work best. And what would you say to the average person? Not Doesn't work in the industry, somewhat concerned about the future, doesn't know if they're helpless or not. What should they be doing in their own lives? My feeling is there's not much they can do. This isn't, isn't going to be decided by, just as climate change isn't going to be decided by people separating out the plastic bags from the um, compostables, that's not going to have much effect. It's going to be decided by whether the lobbyists for the big energy companies can be kept under control. I don't think there's much people can do to, except for try and pressure their governments to force the big companies to work on AI safety. That they can do. You've lived a fascinating, fascinating, winding life. I think one of the things most people don't know about you is that your family has a big history of being involved in tremendous things. You have a family tree, which is one of the most impressive that I've ever seen or read about. Your great Great grandfather, George Ball, founded the Boolean algebra logic, which is one of the foundational principles of modern computer science. You have uh, your great great grandmother, Mary Everest Ball, who was a mathematician and educator who made huge leaps forward in mathematics from what I was able to ascertain. Um, I mean, I can get, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, your great great uncle, George Everest, is what Mount Everest is named after. Is that, is that correct? I think he's my great 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 uncle. His his niece married George Bull. So Mary Mary Bull was Mary Everest Bull. Um, she was the niece of Everest. And your first cousin once removed, Joan Hinton, was involved in the nu a nuclear physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project, which is the World War II development of the first nuclear bomb. Yeah, she was one of the two female physicists at Los Alamos, and then. After they dropped the bomb, she moved to China. Why? She was very cross with them dropping the bomb. And her family had a lot of links with China. Her mother was friends with Chairman Mao. Hmm. Quite weird. 
When you look back at your life, Jeffrey, we have the hindsight you have now and the retro- retrospective clarity. What might you have done differently if you were advising me? I guess I have two pieces of advice. One is, if you have an intuition that people are doing things wrong and there's a better way to do things, don't give up on that intuition just because people say it's silly. Don't give up on the intuition until you've figured out why it's wrong. Figure out for yourself why that intuition isn't correct. And usually it's wrong if it disagrees with everybody else, and you'll eventually figure out why it's wrong. But just occasionally, you'll have an intuition that's actually right and everybody else is wrong. Mm. And I lucked out that way. Early on, I thought neural nets are definitely the way to go to make AI. And almost everybody said that was crazy. And I stuck with it because I couldn't, it just seemed to me it was obviously right. Now, the idea that you should stick with your intuitions isn't going to work if you have bad intuitions. But if you have bad intuitions, you're never going to do anything anyway, so you might as well stick with them. (laughs) And in your own career journey, is there anything you look back on and say, with the hindsight I have now, I should have taken a different approach at that juncture? I wish I'd spent more time with my wife. Um, And with my children when they were little. I was kind of obsessed with work. Your wife passed away? Yeah. From ovarian cancer? No, or that was another wife. Okay. Um, I had two wives die of cancer. Oh, really? Sorry. The first one died of ovarian cancer and the second one died of pancreatic cancer. And you wish you'd spent more time with her? With the second wife, yeah, who was a wonderful person. Why do you say that in your 70s? What is it that you've, you've figured out that I might not know yet? Oh, just because she's gone and I can't spend more time with her now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But you didn't know that at the time. At the time, you think, I mean, it was likely I would die before her just because she was a woman and I was a man. Um, I didn't, I just didn't spend enough time when I could. I I think I, I inquire there because I think there's many of us that are so consumed with what we're doing professionally that we kind of assume immortality with our partners because they've always been there. So we... Yeah. I mean, but she was very supportive of me spending a lot of time working. But... And why do you say your children as well? What's the... What's the well, I didn't spend enough time with them when they were little. And you regret that now? Yeah. <clears throat> if, you, um, if you had a closing message for, for, my, for my listeners about AI and AI safety, what would that be, Jeffrey? There's still a chance that we can figure out how to develop AI that won't want to take over from us. And because there's a chance, we should put enormous resources into trying to figure that out. Because if we don't, it's going to take over. And are you hopeful? I just don't know. I'm agnostic. You must get, get get in bed at night. And when you're thinking to yourself about probabilities of outcomes, there must be a bias in one direction. Because there certainly is for me. I mean, imagine everyone listening now has a internal prediction that they might not say out loud, but of how they think it's going to play out. I really don't know. I genuinely don't know. I think it's incredibly uncertain. When I'm feeling slightly depressed, I think people are toast. The AI is going to take over. When I'm feeling cheerful, I think we'll figure out a way. Maybe one of the facets of being a human... Um, is because we've always been here, like we were saying about our loved ones and our relationships, we assume casually that we will always be here and we'll always figure everything out. But there's a beginning and an end to everything, as we saw from the dinosaurs. I mean, Yeah. And we have to face the possibility that unless we do something soon, we're near the end. We have a closing tradition on this podcast where the last guest leaves a question in their diary. And the question that they've left for you is, with everything that you see ahead of us, what is the biggest threat you see to human happiness? I think the joblessness is a fairly urgent short-term threat to human happiness. 
I think if you make lots and lots of people unemployed, even if they get universal basic income, um, they're not going to be happy. Because they need purpose. Because they need purpose, yes. And struggle. They need to feel they're contributing something. They're useful. And do you think that outcome, that there's going to be huge job displacement, is more probable than not? Yes, I do. And what's That one, I think, is definitely more probable than not. If I worked in a call centre, I'd be terrified. And what's the time frame for that in terms of mass job displacement? I think it's beginning to happen already. I read an article in The Atlantic recently that said it's already getting hard for university graduates to get jobs. And part of that may be that people are already using AI for the jobs they would have got. I spoke to the CEO of a major company that everyone will know of, lots of people use, and he said to me in DMs that they used to have seven, just over 7,000 employees. He said uh, by last year they were down to, I think, 5,000. He said right now they have 3,600. And he said by the end of summer, because of AI agents, they'll be down to 3,000. So, so got, it's happening already. Yes. He's halved his workforce because AI agents can now handle 80% of the customer service inquiries and other things. So it's, it's happening already. Yeah. So urgent action is needed. Yep. I don't know what that urgent action is. That's a tricky one because that depends very much on the political system. And political systems are all going in the wrong direction at present. I mean, what do we need to do? Save up money? Like, do we save money? Do we move to another part of the world? I don't know. What would you tell your kids to do? They said, Dad, like, there's going to be loads of just job displacement. Because I worked for Google for 10 years, they have enough money. <laughs> okay, okay, fine. So what they're if, not typical. What if they didn't have money? Trained to be a plumber. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Jeffrey, thank you so much. You're the first Nobel Prize winner that I've ever had a conversation with, I think, in my life. So that's a, a tremendous honor. And you, you, you received that award for a lifetime of exceptional work in pushing the world forward in so many profound ways that will lead to great, and that have led to great advancements and things that matter so much to us. And now you've turned this season in your life to shining a light on some of your own work, but also on the, the, the broader risks of AI and how... Um, and how it might impact us adversely. And there's very few people that have worked inside the, the machine of a Google or a big tech company that have contributed to the field of AI that are now at the very forefront of warning us against the very thing that they worked upon. There are actually a surprising number of us now. They're not as, uh, as public, and they're actually quite hard to get to have these kinds of conversations because many of them are still in that industry. So, you know, someone who tries to contact these people often and ask, invites them to have conversations, they often are a little bit hesitant to speak openly. So they speak privately, but they're less willing to openly because maybe, maybe they still have something, some sort of incentives at play. I have an advantage over them, which is I'm, I'm older, so I'm unemployed, so I can say what I like. Well, there you go. So thank you for doing what you do. It's a real honor. And please do continue to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. My People think I'm joking when I say that, but I'm not. Oh, the plumbing fish? Yeah. Yeah. And plumbers are pretty well paid. <laughs>